Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Columbus Metropolitan Club. The CMC connects people and ideas through community conversations, through community conversations at forums just like this one every week. I'm Tony Bell, President and CEO of Phoenix Consulting Company, and I'm also proud to serve on CMC's Board of Trustees. We want to uh, let you know that we are so incredibly grateful for today's forum sponsors, the Robert Weiler Company, and thanks, to be, thanks be to God Foundation. Thank you. Let's give them a round of applause. We would also like to thank today's forum partners, Families Flourish, the Ellis, and the presenting sponsor of our live stream, the Center for Human Kindness at the Columbus Foundation. Lastly, we'd like to thank you to our live stream partners, the Columbus Dispatch. Every CMC forum takes a village, and I want to thank you for being our village and supporting today's program, and I hope that our village feeds back into you because this village is reciprocal. So welcome to today's forum. The title is Housing, Health, and Hope, All Things That We Need opening the gates to the opportunity right here in Central Ohio. What would Central Ohio's future look like with safe, affordable, mixed-income neighborhoods as part of everyday life? Hmm. Well, another question, how much healthier, stronger, and equitable would we be in our region with such things? Today, we examine the links connecting housing, health, and opportunity also known as hope. We will also spotlight the will to act that could open the gates to healthier outcomes for all. Could that be the missing part? Hmm. So please welcome today's incred incredibly distinguished panelists, Dr. Craig Pollack, the KDA Endowed Professor at the Johns Hopkins School of Nursing at the John, John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm so excited that I'm stumbling over my words for this amazing panel. Marissa Bowers, Council President and Member at Large with Gahanna City Council. You can clap for each of these people. <laughs> and our forever mayor, Michael B. Coleman, partner with ICE. <laughs> I'm sorry, it doesn't say that in the script. Let me go back. Uh, part, he's now a partner with Ice Miller, and the four, well, of course he's our four-term and longest-serving mayor, but he's one of our favorites. <laughs> I think I'm not allowed to say favorite because we have a current mayor whom we love very much, but you know, it's okay to laugh. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> We also have Kenneth Wright, mayor and council member at large for the city of Westerville. I let him know that that's where my favorite pool, my favorite swimming pool is for the summer. So thank you, Westerville. And to our host, Darcy Congrove, managing director with GBQ. Okay, so today's lunch conversation, I invite our very special guest from Baltimore, or for some people known as Be More or Baltimore in Maryland, uh, <laughs> national health and housing expert, Dr. Craig Pollack, to the podium to set the stage for our conversation. So, Dr. Pollack, the podium's yours. So thank you so much for having me uh, for this important discussion. I'm going to be talking about what we know about the connections between housing and health, and I'm going to go through the four pillars of housing and health. Those are housing affordability, stability, housing quality, and neighborhood context. And in thinking about how to do this, I came to mind a patient that I saw in my primary care clinic just a couple weeks ago. And Missy is a longtime primary care patient of mine, woman in her 40s, and rather than coming into the office like she was planning to do, it was scheduled and turned into a video visit. And so she, there she was in the car, asked her to pull over to the side of the road so we could talk, and I asked, well, what's going on, Missy? Why, why aren't you in clinic today? And she explained to me that she had a move, that her house had black mold in it and it, she didn't feel like it was safe for her anymore. She had looked for a new place to live, but she couldn't find a place that was affordable. So instead, she moved in with her mom, someone who she had kind of a, a difficult relationship with over the years. But she told me it was better than being homeless. The irony of the situation was not lost on her. 
Ms. C worked at a local housing authority where she was on the wait list for a housing voucher but hadn't yet received it. And so I think Ms. C's story is something that is a kind of an extreme example of something that I see in my primary care clinic and something that we know about our family members and our neighbors and our loved ones around the difficulties in having uh, and finding a, a stable, affordable place to live right now. So let me go through a little bit about each of those four pillars, thinking about Ms. C's story, um, and then kind of have a, a discussion about it. So the first pillar that we think about with uh, kind of the connection between housing and health is the role of housing affordability. And we all know that we're in a housing affordability crisis right now. 42 million Americans are, are paying uh, more than 30% of their, their incomes on rent and utilities, living in unaffordable housing. 50% of renters are living in unaffordable housing. And when that happens, people make trade-offs that are harmful to their health. There's trade-offs in terms of whether they're going to buy food or pay for the rent, whether they can pay for their health care or pay for the rent. And what we see is that as people pay more for the rent, they have less money left over after the rent eats to afford their health care, to afford their, their food. And it's not that they have less need for health care or less need for food, it's just that there's not enough money at the end of the month. We also know, as the story illustrated, that about one in four households that are eligible for housing assistance end up receiving it. Housing assistance is a, in contrast to a lot of our entitlement programs, are, is, not, is, is not an entitlement. So not everyone that's eligible for housing assistance is able to receive it. The wait list in Baltimore is currently incredibly long and closed to new applicants. Which leads us to our next uh, kind of pillar, which is around housing instability. Frequent moves we know disrupts people's lives in really important ways. I didn't mention that Ms. C also had diabetes, true story, and she had lost her glucometer, her ability to check her blood sugars when she was moving. And so she didn't know what her sugar was doing. She didn't know whether she was taking the right amount of meds. And that's one example that we see all the time of people when they're forced to move, they're disrupted in their lives, they're disrupted in their health care, they're disrupted in their social networks. And this is really an enormous problem. We know that about 6% of renters face eviction notices every year, or about 2.7 million households. So the, the trouble is enormous. The third pillar that I often think about is around quality of housing. And this is around, for example, lead paint, something that we often think about when we think about housing is the quality of it. Um, and we know that lead paint, for example, leads to uh, neuro neurodevelopment problems in children. We know about asthma triggers. We know that there's so many things in people's environments that can be damaging to health. And having a safe place to live really needs to incorporate those factors. The last uh, place that I want to spend a little bit more time on is around the neighborhood context. And this is a place where we've done a lot of research um, at, with my team at Hopkins looking at these housing mobility programs. So housing mobility programs stem out of fair housing lawsuits, lawsuits in Chicago, Baltimore, other places that said that, that uh, a lot of different organizations, including public housing authorities, were violating fair housing laws in, uh, in segregating families in poor, underserved neighborhoods. And as part of the remedy for that, they've created programs that have helped families move to quote unquote opportunity neighborhoods, meaning they have more resources. I also want to say at the outset, and I think it's an important framing for this conversation, when we're talking about mobility and, and giving people access to different neighborhoods, we shouldn't be talking about this in an either or framework. We're often talking about you're helping families move or you're investing in places. And I think that kind of zero sum framing is really dangerous for this conversation. And I think we need to think of it as a both and. And in the setting of mobility, it's really an important, um, it's an important policy tool that's getting a lot of attention, which I think is appropriate. And it's also a really important way to try to understand uh, about the neighborhood context in ways that's, uh, that leads to stronger evidence and stronger understanding. And there have been a number of studies on this, which I won't have time to go into now, uh, including the, the landmark moving to opportunity, which was very cool in that it was randomized, so it was able to separate the many constraints that people have about where they live um, and study the long-term benefits of mobility. And what they found with this is that, and Raj Chetty and colleagues found that kids who had the chance to move at a young age tended to have higher earnings as adults. Some of the work that we've done showed that over 21 years of follow-up, kids that had the chance to move, uh, especially those at a younger age, had a lower risk of hospitalization over time, leading to less hospital spending, and especially reductions in mental health-related hospitalizations and asthma. 
In part, building on those findings, we did a study in Baltimore with the Baltimore Regional Housing Partnership, which is a housing mobility program there, where we followed kids with asthma. And we looked at them before they moved and followed them after they moved, doing really careful home assessments. What we found was striking. For kids with asthma, the rates of asthma attacks were reduced by about 50% after they moved. This is like online with a lot of the medicines that we use to treat asthma. And when we went and looked at it, we thought this is gonna be a story of mouse and cockroach allergens, that we know that mouse, mouse and cockroach allergens are the triggers for a lot of asthma exacerbations in Baltimore City. And you know, by moving, they're gonna reduce those and that's what's gonna change uh, the asthma exacerbations and the asthma symptoms that kids experience. That's not what we found. Those things matter, but the thing that really mattered in our study was related to urban stress. That families, as they moved, experienced much less urban stress, and that was a key factor in their children experiencing less asthma exacerbations. And I think underlying each of those four factors that I talked about, housing affordability, stability, quality, and neighborhood context is the important role of stress and the uh, important choices that families get to make about where they live in safe and, and hopeful environments. So with that, I thank you for your time. Hello, everyone. I'm Darcy Kingrove, and I have the privilege of being the moderator of today's forum. Uh, first, I want to thank Dr. Pollock for making the trip and also for sharing a personal story about a real person who has lived through some of these issues that we're going to talk about today. I think that humanizes it for all of us. Uh, I get the privilege now of opening up our conversation with our panel uh, to talk about uh, opening the gates uh, that prevent many of our residents in central Ohio from having choices about where to live. And we're going to start with Mayor Coleman. Uh, you have frequently talked about the gates that keep people in and the gates that keep people out in our community. Can you elaborate on that? And then we'll, we'll have our other panelists join in on this question as well. Um, uh, uh, first, let me just say I'm, I'm honored to be here. Thank you very much and uh, see all these wonderful people out here. These great panelists as well uh, know a whole lot more about this stuff than I do. Uh, I'm just speaking from a point of view of uh, 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 community leadership, uh, living through it and experience. Um, uh, in 43 years, in the, 44 years living in the city of Columbus, of which over half of that I was in public office, uh, of which over half of that I was the mayor of the city. Uh, and. Uh, met many challenges over these years, and I'm really looking at this, this question more in the rear view mirror as to how our community, our region, developed over time. And over time, uh, and I might say as long as 75, 100 years, the Columbus region was developed into two communities. The gated communities, they're both gated communities. The gated community that kept people out, and then there's the gated community that kept people in. Our government policies were built around those two concepts. First, let me talk about the gated communities that keep people in. The gated communities that keep people in are those communities where people of lower economic means live, where uh, black folks, brown folks live, uh, where uh, issues of safety and, uh, occur, where not great housing exists occur, and in those gated communities, the policy of government is, let's go in and change those communities. And that's a good thing. The good thing is that government, including me, had the philosophy of going into those gated communities and trying to change them for the better. That philosophy needs to continue. I support it 100%. But here's what happens. It takes decades 
to transform a neighborhood. And in the meantime, people fall between the cracks. The great intention of changing neighborhoods needs to continue with fervor and focus. But what happens is there is an unsaid thing that you're stuck in this gated community and you can't come out. Because there's other gated communities, and those are the gated communities that keep people out. And those are just the opposite of the gated communities that keep people in. Usually a predominant race that isn't brown or black, wealthier individuals, higher income, better housing, better schools as well. Oh, what a coincidence. And lo and behold, the people in the gated communities that keep people in can't go into the gated communities to keep people out because they're gated on both sides. And so part of the challenge is always going to be how do you not just open up the gated communities, how do you rip down the gates permanently to ensure that those who live in the gated communities can live in the other gated communities that keep people out. And so, historically, it seems to me government has worked in silos. We look at housing, but we don't look at healthcare and housing. We look at housing, but don't understand the connection between housing and education. And we don't think about education, we think about housing alone. And those mobility programs like Families Flourish, where they look at everything combined, the wraparound services associated with good housing, subsidized with coaching and, and uh, 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 educational opportunities and job opportunities, healthcare opportunities, and you wrap those all around that same family. They do well. The results are there. So that's what I mean by gated communities, and I have a whole lot more to say. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, let's, let's talk about Mayor Coleman's um, dichotomy, though, of the, the in and the out. And our perception, I think, is that life is different than that in the suburbs. And um, maybe Councilwoman Bowers, we'll start with you. Talk a little bit about Gahanna and how, how this issue lands in Gahanna. Sure. Well, uh, thank you also, and thank you so much for having me here today. I uh, was sharing with a dear friend and coworker uh, that I had been invited to serve on a panel about uh, health and housing, and he paused and he looked at me and he said, "Are you qualified for that?" <laughs> And, and I said, no, of course not. But the reality is, is that we all must become qualified on this subject because, to Mayor Coleman's point, this is a holistic issue. We have to, as community leaders, as decision makers, and as activists in the community, we have to be able to recognize the connection between what health, what a healthy, holistic community looks like and how, that, how housing fits into that. In Gahanna, um, we have a little bit of a unique situation. Uh, Gahanna has sort of been under the radar for many, many years. And we have um, developed organically and, and sort of um, by happenstance uh, over the last predominantly 30 years when our population really grew. Gahanna is a community now of 36,000 with about 12.7 square miles. Uh, most of our community is developed at this point in time, uh, and we are adjacent uh, to, bounder, bound, bounded by mostly Columbus. So what we see uh, in terms of how we continue to provide housing access uh, to our residents is maintaining the natural affordability that we've enjoyed, maintaining the access and the openness um, where we have a strong, uh, uh, strong uh, population, where diversity numbers are reflected in our population in a better way, frankly, than some other suburbs. Um, and so continuing to, to protect that, continuing to protect that access, that quality of life uh, and, and that path forward. 
some of the things that we're working on uh, beyond uh, uh, the ability to potentially add housing where, where we can uh, is to make sure that the quality of life, uh, to Dr. Pollock's uh, final point about neighborhood uh, stability and neighborhood services, making sure that our community remains really healthy. And what we mean by that is protecting our tree canopy, because we know that there's a direct relation to health and the preser uh, preservation and, and presence of a tree canopy in a community. Working on making sure that our community has active uh, transportation, including multi-purpose paths and, and sidewalks, and ensuring that those sidewalks and that pedestrian infrastructure is as safe as possible for all of our community, uh, community members. And in addition, building our relationship and maintaining our relationship with our school district, because we recognize in Gahanna this, this connection between the strength of our district and the strength of our city. So in those areas, those are some of the ways that we're highlighting uh, these issues. Thank you. Mayor Wright? Okay, first, thank you for the opportunity to be here um, among this distinguished panel. Let me start by saying I am a transplant to Ohio. My family and I moved here from Washington, D.C. in 2005. So just over 19 years, we've been a part of Central Ohio. We did not know the first thing about Westerville when we moved there. All we knew is that it had a great school system and it had the house that my wife and I wanted. She wanted a nice outside deck and I wanted a master bedroom away from the children. <laughs> now, when we moved to Westerville, we drove seven hours, two cars, well, one car and a U-Haul with my wife and me, three children and two cats. It was about a seven hour drive, give or take. And when we pulled up to our house, the streets were lined with cars. In our driveway, there were cars. And I'm thinking to myself, what's going on? We moved in June, the first part of June. And that was the height of graduation season and graduation parties. And our neighbors were having a graduation party and our house had been vacant for so long that it was being used for parking, parties, whatever. <laughs> so we pull up, I'm tired, I'm mad, okay? My wife, ever the extrovert, wants to go out and find out what's going on. And she finds out where the party is being held, and she goes and meets the neighbors. They're very apologetic, and the neighbors were wonderful, wonderful. They opened up their arms and welcomed us. They brought us food. They allowed us to use their vehicles while we transitioned. I'm like, where did we move? Uh, because that was foreign to me. But there was this welcoming spirit right there on that cul-de-sac. And I thought, hey, we did good. We moved to a great place. Now, leaving that cul-de-sac, something different. You know, Westerville wasn't that welcoming, you know, for the most part. Um, and it wasn't until several years later that I decided to get involved with Westerville. And in so learning, um, I found out that um, Westerville has grown in size and scope and becoming a more welcoming and inclusive community over the years. Westerville, in my opinion, is the gem of central Ohio. We are 12 square miles northeast of Columbus we have more than 650 acres of parkland. We've got 51 miles of trails, and about 95% of all of our residents live within a half mile of a developed park. We have a thriving business community, and we have a historic uptown. Now, with all of that, that's very attractive for people wanting to come to Westerville, wanting to live in Westerville, but it's also one of the reasons why there's some nimbyism, you know, that all of these great things about Westerville we want to keep to ourselves, you know. Um, so it's been a hurdle to bring in more housing, more um, population to Westerville. But to the city's credit, we know that population is coming. We know that we need housing. So the city has been very thoughtful and very intentional 
in its development strategies. Um, I've been on council, this is my second term, and I really started to dive into what the councils before me were into. And it started with a community plan that laid out how the city envisioned its thoughtful growth and development over the years. And then shortly after that, we did an attainable housing study as to what the residents thought attainable housing, affordable housing should look like. So using that as the benchmark, Westerville has done several things over the past five years. We've added just under 900 dwelling units, a combination of multifamily and single family. We've added source of income protection. We've added a density bonus in areas where there's access to public transportation, um, high, high, high traffic areas, and we've also done ordinances for ADUs. Now we realize that building new development is going to be tricky because we are landlocked and a lot of the development has, has happened but we're looking into that. But in the meantime, we have done ordinance on accessory dwelling units. We're looking to keep our residents in their homes because a lot of times our residents are struggling you know, to um, handle various costs. So we wanna make sure that our residents can stay in their homes. And one thing we did recently is we partnered with Morpsey to create one of the first of its kind pilot housing pro uh, programs in which residents who are at 100% or less of the uh, Columbus AMI have the opportunity to have a $25,000 grant, a $25,000 grant for home improvements, for home repairs, your roof, your HVAC. Um, in these times where costs are astronomical, Every little bit helps. And that's one way that Westerville is helping its residents. We're trying to keep them in their homes as something we can do right now. And then we're going to tackle how we build additional housing units for the anticipated population that we see coming in. So to answer the question, I went all the way around. Um, we are working to help address the region's housing situation but we're doing it thoughtfully, strategically, and methodically. Thank you. I think, I think that takes us to the question of zoning and the, the impact that zoning has. And as you all know, because you're informed CMC attendees, uh, the city of Columbus has just passed pretty significant zoning uh, legislation changes. And that includes an, an emphasis on what we're calling corridors that are open for public transit that could handle more density. And uh, Mayor Coleman, I'd like, to, I'd like to hear your perspective on, on whether you think this is gonna be the right step to get us moving in the direction that we think we need to go in the city. Uh, I do. I think it was um, a, a visionary thing for the city to promote and to get through this is new zoning package. I see we have a former member of council here, Elizabeth Brown. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, and uh, others who were involved in that. Uh, but let me also say that uh, these kinds of activities of uh, making housing uh, uh, denser, more important, cheaper, not, not cheap, but more affordable, um, is a responsibility of not just the city of Columbus. Uh, it is a regional responsibility. And like in Gahanna, like in Westerville, you got two visionary leaders here. Um, uh, the issue of housing, education, and health, those three things, is a regional question. And you can't talk about one without talking about the other. And in the city of Columbus, uh, when it comes to education, I am gravely concerned about what I'm seeing today with our uh, uh, public education system. I'm a strong supporter of, of our uh, uh, CCS uh, and what it does, but I, 
also believe it needs intervention today. It needs intervention. Uh, the business community has turned its back to uh, our public school system. I'm troubled by it, very troubled by it. And our civic community is just now starting to stand up. I saw some preachers come out the past couple days, read in the Columbus Dispatch. I commend them for stepping up, saying, you got to see a change. And our political leadership needs to come together as well. Our system in Columbus Public Schools needs intervention. But when you intervene in that, you're also helping housing. And you're also helping health care. All these things, as my colleague here says together, they have to be looked at holistically. And unfortunately, we've developed a bunch of silos in this community, a bunch of gated communities in this region, and we need to tear down the silos, tear down the gates, and begin to address these things holistically. With everybody at the table, no backs turned. I want, to go, I want to go back to Mayor Wright. Talk a little bit about, you, you talked about a number of things you're doing to increase housing units. How does that balance against gentrification and, and perhaps pushing some people out? How are, you, how are you finding that? Welcoming and bringing more people in without creating a place that, that, that some people just can't stay any longer? That is a good question. How do we bring people in and, and one keep, more time. And keep the others there, right? As, as inevitably, I think, as development happens, we presume that the cost goes up, right? And that that perhaps then makes living in Westerville unattainable for others. How, how do we balance that? So as I mentioned, we're, we're tackling what we can address right now, the low-hanging fruit, if you will and that is keeping our residents in their homes. <clears throat> During the pandemic, um, Westerville uh, initiated a utility holiday where one month we forgave um, electrical billing for our residents and our businesses because we knew that during the pandemic, you know, people were out of work, um, times were tough, and we wanted to do our part. Um, <clears throat> During that time, Westerville created a program called Westerville Helps. And that is a program that allows residents to get financial assistance for utilities, um, for minor home repairs, up to $5,000 will be reimbursed by the city, and also for parks and recreation. Because to the point of health and wellness, we want people to be, in, to be able to enjoy our parks but sometimes people could not afford that or they had to make a, a choice between do I have my park subscription or do I you know, pay the bill, do I pay the rent or mortgage or what have you. So we created that, that Westerville Helps um, program to assist our residents to keep them in their homes. And as I mentioned, we took that program even further with the partnership with Morpsey to help with more expensive um, home repairs. Um, I'm starting to lose my train of thought, sorry, <laughs> but I've got so many things going on in my head um, and I'm trying to be concise. But the opportunity is to listen to what our residents are saying. And many are saying that they want to be able to stay in their homes particularly our seniors who want to age in their homes, but they're concerned with the rising costs or with the rising property values come the property taxes. And they're fearful that they may be priced out of Westerville. Now, Westerville is, in, is, is considered a um, progressive and, um, um, what's the word we're looking for? A high rent kind of, kind of place or what have you. But, that's not the word I want to use, but you, you get what I'm saying. Um, <clears throat> but there are people, there are pockets in Westerville of people who are hurting. And I know that. 
And I've known that through my conversations with residents. And what I want to do <clears throat> is to bring those available resources to our residents where they can tap into a community action agency, where they can tap into a um, Families Flourish or another organization that they may be unaware of those services that are provided. In May, Westerville held its first ever affordable housing resource fair in partnership with the uh, Columbus Auditor's Office. And it was a very well attended event. And our residents were appreciative of the fact that we brought to them access to resources that they may, uh, that they may not otherwise have known about. So doing those type of things has been a way that we are addressing what's going on right now while planning for how we're going to tackle larger issues as far as more housing units, um, dealing with the, the balance between housing development and economic development, and making sure that the residents feel that we're not growing too fast. Because Westerville is known as a city in the park. We've got a lot of beautiful green spaces, and some residents are concerned that we're growing too fast and we're losing that, that close-knit community feel. And we want to make sure that we're protecting that, but we're also being focused on the future. Thank you. And I, I want to ask the question, but I, you have less time because we're, we're going to try to get back to Dr. Pollock here too. Tell us the same, same question for, re, regarding Gehanna. Absolutely. Thank you so much. So I wanted to reference uh, Franklin County Commissioner Kevin Boyce issued a white paper at the beginning of this year. It was issued, printed in uh, January of 2024 um, addressing uh, housing affordability. And in that uh, white paper, he indicates that uh, housing prices surged from 2020 to 2023 by $103,000 on average in our, in our county. And I know I've seen that reflected on my auditor's value and in the house and the sales that are going on in my neighborhood, uh, if not more than that, right? So, so we need to, and there are a lot of factors that have gone into those increased costs of housing. Some of it is building materials uh, and, and increased costs on developers to, to build more uh, projects and thinking about ways, to Mayor Coleman's point, about helping um, uh, be very innovative in how we're, we're reducing those costs of new builds, but also thinking about what's been going on with markets that has driven up these costs uh, by square foot. So when you have uh, investors, uh, large nas na national investors buying single single-family homes in our most affordable communities, they are depleting the housing stock that would be available to our working families. And I thank Senator Sherrod Brown for tackling this issue. It is a hard issue to tackle, but it is one that we absolutely need to talk about. There are other costs that are going into this, and I appreciate some of the uh, comments that Mayor Wright made about um, making sure that we're helping to address the uh, costs of home ownership where we can, but we need to address why are investors, why are companies that can profit off of our working class families' homes buying up properties uh, that take that away? So some things that we're working on that we're exploring in Gahanna is I would like to make sure that we are being really intentional about short-term rental uh, policy. Short-term rentals are typically, uh, they, they can be uh, a rental in your own, you know, one of your bedrooms in your own home, but what we're seeing is that that's not necessarily the case. We're seeing that it's the case that it's businesses that are buying up properties that are renting one week at a time for, what, for much more than I pay for my mortgage. We're also seeing issues related to, um, uh, um, uh, again, uh, investors buying up properties uh, in large numbers across our communities. So I think those are some things that we absolutely need to address. We need to think about how we're talking about them and recognizing all of the factors that are going into driving up the cost of, uh, of, of properties. Thank you. So it's, it's obviously not a quick solution to build more housing, right, or to refurbish the housing that we have. And in the meanwhile, we still have a lot of people who are experiencing health issues based upon where they live. So let's go back to that for a minute, Dr. Pollock, and talk to us about what, what kind of the primary issues are that you see within families and children 
um, that result from living in housing that is substandard? And, and are there things that we can do in the meanwhile while we try to move this huge rock uphill uh, to solve the overall problem? Sure, thank you for that question. So it seems like we've been talking a lot about the supply side of housing and trying to build more houses. We know that we've underbuilt since the, the subprime mortgage crisis, that we don't have enough homes, we don't have enough affordable homes. We also need to think about the demand side of the equation and how do we support families, especially low-income families that need the supports. And so when we talk about housing vouchers uh, as one possibility, housing vouchers and the supports such as Families Flourish and what the types of services that they provide are an important example of uh, what we can do to try to support families uh, in this time when there's just not enough housing, when the, uh, the wages that people earn are not enough to meet. The, the needs of their household. In terms of thinking about kind of what are ways that, that we should be thinking about the kind of the health problems that families face, they're really multifaceted. It's one of those fundamental cause problems where it's not just around cancer, it's not just about high blood pressure, it's not just about diabetes. There's evidence that housing affects all of these different conditions for adults and especially for children, especially our youngest children. And so, um, and I think in the healthcare model of disease, we often think about kind of the, the high risk, high cost individuals that cost the system a lot of money from a healthcare uh, and I think that that is one important way, one important lens to think about this problem, but we also need to think about it through other angles, especially, if, for example, with children, where we know that children don't necessarily cost the healthcare system very much money early on in the, in the short term because, you know, thankfully, they gen tend to be pretty healthy. But over the long term, when we think about the compounding effects of the investments that we're making right now, that's where I think we can see some, uh, some real, real, uh, real play and traction around it. Thank you. Well, as you all know, it's time, right? We uh, always encourage audience questions at CMC. So we'll move to questions from our live stream and our audience. And if you want to, if you're here in the building, uh, back to the microphone in the back. I think, Doug, you're ready. Darcy, thank you very much, and thank you to today's panelists. Uh, please do join us, although I, we're running short on time. We'll try to keep uh, each question and answer to about two minutes or so. Great questions at CMZ always have two things in common. They take less than 30 seconds to ask, and what punctuation mark do they end in? A question mark, yes, thank you, everybody. Uh, Bill Lafayette, watching on the live stream audience, asks, uh, how can civic and neighborhood leaders overcome NIMBY fears? NIMBY is not in my backyard. How can they overcome NIMBY fears among residents? Well, I don't know if you can stop it. What it takes is the political courage of those in power to say this is the direction we're going. And over time, the NIMBYs will be yep, yes bees or whatever you call them. Uh, it takes political courage to stand up to NIMBYism, saying it's not acceptable. It's almost like racism. You've got to stand up to it, say it's not acceptable in this community. And if you want to offer constructive ideas on how to get things done other than I don't want those people living next door to me, that is welcome but it takes courage and political stand-upness. We're going this direction, and you need to follow. So I also wanted to add that having meaningful conversations uh, with people who may um, have an initial opposition to a project is really critical. These are our neighbors, these are our, our they go to school with our kids, um, and being able to identify what their real fears are. Are their fears, uh, their, their fears are about um, loss of something, right? It's loss of uh, quality of schools or loss of value of their own property. Identifying that and being able to combat that with facts when they're open to it um, and uh, explaining to them that, that their regional leaders are prepared for the growth. I have found that to be an effective way to address some of those concerns. Right. Okay. Here we go to the question in the back. Right. Hi, Joel Jones here in support of the awesome organization Family Flourish. Question, uh, in a capitalistic society, is it logical to expect equity in housing? And if so, what is the role of government in holding corporations responsible in a capitalistic society to deliver affordable housing? In, and I'm talking specifically to developers about development. That's a, a fantastic question, and thank you so much for asking that. Uh, 
You know, one of the, again, leaning into these hard conversations and making sure that they understand that their investment in our community invests in their future workforce. Um, making sure that they understand that by asking for abatements of 80 or 100 percent, that they are harming our school districts by doing that, and that we need to have honest conversations about how those tax dollars that are generated, those jobs that are important to bring to our community are also supporting the holistic health and well-being of our community through our schools and the access uh, to services that local government can provide. I also want to add to that to say that we have an enormous tax incentive for homeowners through the mortgage interest deduction, right? And so when we're thinking about housing policy, we really need to think about it holistically. And I'm not arguing that we should do away with that uh, deduction in any sense, but what I'm saying is that we already subsidize homeowners to a tremendous extent and thinking about what is fair to lower income renters uh, in order to make sure that their needs are met as well. Hi. Oh, can you hear me? Okay. Um, my name is Carolyn Fowler, and I have a question. Um, I think something that's really interesting about Columbus is that despite the fact that we are a mid-sized city, Columbus has some of the highest eviction rates of the country. Um, in 2016, Columbus had more eviction decisions by number than the entire city of Chicago. Um, and so I would love to hear what the panel thinks on how Columbus should address such high eviction rates. Well, I guess... Uh, let me think about that. Let me try to answer it uh, the best I can. Um, and I need a little help from the current. I can share a little okay. bit about what, okay. we're, what we've oh, done. Yeah. It, yeah. So a ahead. little bit about what we've done in Gahanna. And I, again, want to shout out to our um, colleagues in Colum on Columbus City Council who have also leaned into this conversation. We have adopted a comprehensive fair housing code that includes source of income protection and a pay, codified pay to stay uh, to help address some of these concerns. Um, so those are some things at a local policy level uh, to that point to help address, help address the high eviction rates in the county. If I could add to that, <clears throat> I referenced the, um, the housing study that we did and that identified that there are significant numbers of Westerville residents who are cost burden, uh, meaning they are spending more than 30% of their income on housing costs. And there are residents who are severely cost burden. That was the impetus for us creating the Westerville Helps program. It was the impetus behind the, the housing pilot program helping residents who are financially challenged be able to pay their main housing expenses and not have to worry about additional costs. So where we're, where we're able to help out, that's what we're doing as a way to address those shortfalls that they may have with their housing expenses. I would say from a health perspective, we've been doing some work in a study that's going to come out uh, very soon, led by Kate Leifheit at UCLA, that has been taking advantage of the fact that New York rolled out their right to counsel program in a piecemeal zip code by zip code fashion, showing that those zip codes that got right to counsel had better birth outcomes for the families living there. And so I think right to counsel, if it hasn't been explored yet, is one possibility of trying to help, uh, help it, renters uh, avoid eviction and with potential spillover effects on health. City attorney is taking notes. I'm sorry. There was... We have just a couple of minutes left. We'll try to get to at least two more questions. Hi, my name is Howard Levitt, and I'm with uh, Families Flourish. Quick question: We keep talking about increasing housing, but I'm curious: How do we address the three forces against that? Prior to 2000, before the banking collapse, we we're building two million homes a year in this country. We're down to less than 600,000. Then the second issue is, is that you talked about increasing like in Westerville and Gahanna, other housing, but the local power, people don't want to expand that because they're worried about it's affecting their income. And if Gahanna becomes, is a nice place to move to and we keep the cost down, more people move to Gahanna, which increases the cost of the houses. So we have these three different forces that affect housing. How do we address that? In 30 seconds or less, sorry. <laughs> well. In Westerville, we're looking at a lot of mixed-use opportunities where we've got um, retail businesses on the first floor and then dwelling units on the higher levels. We're also looking at our density bonus areas where we can have multifamily housing that's not going to 
um, be too much different than the established communities, because that's what some of our residents are concerned about, is that multifamily units might uh, change the character or the, the makeup of their neighborhood. So there are places in Westerville where we can build up, not necessarily build out, because we are landlocked, and we are being thoughtful about those type of developments. Hello, thank you all for the great conversation. I'm Michelle Missler the, with the American Association of Service Coordinators, and I'm just curious what we know about the intersectionality between health and housing is that there's great resources. You guys have told about great programs that we're seeing in different communities for the residents in the housing. But what I'm curious about is how do folks connect to those? So within the service coordinator field through HUD affordable housing, what we know is service coordinators are essential to connecting those residents to the resources within a community to help maintain their housing and help improve their health. So I'm just curious how you all see the um, importance of services within the housing or connecting to um, services within the community. What was the question? <laughs> Sorry, how do you see the, how, how do you envision the future of services within housing and how do we um, create that within our community? Well, yeah, so, uh, it's a good question, and I can have Amy Claven stand up right here. Uh, stand up, Amy. She's with Families Flourish. And what, and I've become a champion of Families Flourish because what they do is connect the dots. They're not dealing with the housing issue by itself, uh, provide a, I don't know, 500 whatever dollars of subsidy, that's a good thing, um, helps put um, those in gated communities and gated communities they were been excluded from. And I will tell you, some of those gated communities are not in the suburban areas. This right here within the boundaries of the city of Columbus. There are certain parts of the city that uh, I know families that say, I could never live there yet you only live three blocks away. Across a certain street, the uh, apartments become, you know, three times more expensive. The property values are substantially higher. Um, uh, so uh, connecting the dots, having a more holistic approach to housing is, I think, the future of America. I know that in the, uh, uh, hopefully the, the new administration in Washington, and you know it's what I'm talking about, I'm wearing blue today, <laughs> in celebration of that in advance, um, uh, I'm confident they're going to start talking about how do you connect the dots. That it's not just a housing issue, we gotta deal with the health issue, we have to deal with the education issue, and some other safety issues. And, and how do you create that holistic approach to shelter and to housing? Uh, and I think that's, frankly, the answer. This is a fantastic conversation, and hopefully we can continue uh, in future forums to talk about more. But we're, I'm getting the signal back there from Doug that we got to wrap it up. So we're going to let everybody move on with their day, and I'm going to turn the podium back over to Tony. Okay, so I have to apologize for my low energy on the way up here at the beginning of this, because this topic is really heavy. But you know what? I got some groove with me, and I was hearing, I kept hearing in my head the Beatles song, Come Together, right? Come together. That's what I was hearing. So I hope you found today's community conversation hopeful that we will become qualified on the subject to thoughtfully and strategically open the gates, because why? We are better together. And yes, we are better together because we what? Come together. <laughs> right now. Don't hire me for my singing, hire me for my personality. All right, thank you so much to today's forum sponsors, the Robert Weiler Company, thanks to the thanks to, thanks to the Thanks Be to God Foundation, and today's forum partners, Family 
families flourish, and the Ellis. We are also grateful to presenting sponsor of our live stream, the Center for Human Kindness at the Columbus Foundation, and our live stream partner as well, the Columbus Dispatch, and a very, very special appreciation today's speakers. Since I'm referencing, you know, parties and, and singers, let's throw our hands in the air uh, for, and, and wave them like we don't care for uh, Craig Pollock. Marissa Bowers, Mayor Michael B. Coleman, Mayor Kenneth Wright, and our fantastic host, Darcy Grove, Managing Director with GBQ. I swear, I wish we had more time. We can keep, if you want to have an after party, we can keep this conversation going. But I think the Ellis wants us out of here at a reasonable time. So uh, please also note that the, there are the next three forums uh, will be at our alternative location because of the Italian festival. Uh, so we will be at View Columbus, which is a beautiful space as well, um, including next Wednesday's forum. Are you ready for next Wednesday's forum title? Yes, you are. Drum roll, please. Outdated funding, lost lives, why Ohio's babies and birthing parents deserve better. Because why? We're better together. Because we have to what? One more time, a little louder. Thank you very much. So please register and secure your spot.